This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. I have one hand up for you today. I'm actually, I don't expect to get to the material today, uh, but I don't see the disadvantage of giving it to you in case you're bored over the weekend and have nothing else to do. You can read about XML and Python and uh, networking. Um, what I want to do today is I want to focus a little bit more on dictionaries and show you an example um, where dictionaries actually contribute to a meaningful program. I'm going to rewrite um, RSG from assignment one in Python. We're going to do it in laughably little space. Uh, I'm going to be able to illustrate uh, a very small program that has the imperative, object-oriented, and the functional paradigm all in it. Okay, I'll illustrate lambdas, that they actually exist in Python, uh, and it's really just a matter of coming up, d knowing the, the, the different syntax, the Python way of doing what you did in Scheme uh, a week and a half ago, or just I guess until last night, or two nights ago rather. Um, the, uh, I also want to talk a little bit about objects and classes in Python, talk about the object model. It's very interesting to, to look at it because when you learn about uh, objects and object orientation and in a class like 107 where you look under the hood to figure out how these things are implemented, you can very easily get the impression, like I did for years to be honest, um, that all objects and everything's implemented exactly the same way in all languages. And that's just not the case. So I will talk about that a little bit today. Um, with regard to uh, dictionaries, uh, I mentioned on, uh, I guess it was Monday, what's today? No, Wednesday. Oh, sorry, Wednesday. <laughs> um, that dictionaries are a central data structure um, in Python. They are basically a very simple syntax layer over what is very well understood to be a hash table. The keys can be anything that are hashable. They don't even have to be heterogeneous. You can have some integers and some strings as your keys. And the things that they map to, the, the values, they can be of any type whatsoever. And they don't have to be consistent with the same type over the dictionary. It is very amorphous, very uh, heterogeneous, just like um, Scheme is with its data structures. You can put anything in a list. You can mix up data types. You can do the same thing with Python structures. Okay. Um, what I want to do is I want to um, emphasize the fact that as opposed to C and C++, uh, where you don't have a clear way to um, textually initialize a data structure. Like think about what a C++ map or a C vector from assignment three looks like after you've populated it with say 20 values. It actually depends on the binary representation of the data. Okay, and there's no way to say um, uh, C++ vector of ints is equal to one, two, three, four, five. Okay, you don't have object literals in C or C++, or for that, for that matter, Java either. Okay, you can have array literals in Java in a way that you can in C and C++, but the real sophisticated containers, there's no way to actually um, specify container constants. That's not the case with Python. Uh, the first of two, three or four pieces of the RSG example, I won't write out a, a full grammar, but what I'm basically doing here is I'm coming up with a file format for um, uh, a random sentence generator grammar. You are familiar with this. I know it's been eight weeks ago, but you remember that it had involved some angle brackets for non-terminals and things that were terminals were just normal strings. Um, if I do this grammar, I'm actually writing Python code. Now I will make it clearly a dictionary. I'm going to have a grammar that is just a gesture to what the full grammar could be like. Um, but my grammar is going to be expressed as a dictionary literal, where the keys are structured this way, uh, and they map to uh, arrays, which are called lists in Python, okay, or at least the way I use them, I call them lists, um, lists of expansions. And for start, I'm only going to have one expansion. So here's the list. It happens to be a, a list of length one, and that item is itself a list, and I'm going to do it this way. It's not a very sexy sentence. It's just a placeholder. This object, oops, is here. If I had a second or third option, they would have been common to limited lists. I'm not going to have that for this one. I'm just going to have one option. Just so you see the structure in a small example. But I will let object 
map to a couple of options. It can map to the standalone thing like computer. I'll let it map to, um, I don't know, this car, this uh, assignment. I'm not interested in grammatically, grammatically meaningful sentences. I'm just <laughs> interested in getting the grammar on the board. I think this is complicated enough. You look at this and you may think that there's really no other sensible way to do this, but realize that kind of like you have in Scheme, that you are allowed to represent the data in object ser serialized object form, okay? A and that this actually gets grammar to be an in-memory dictionary where it has two keys and each one maps to a list of lists, where this one happens to be a list of length one and this happens to be a list of length three. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm being fastidious about the white spacing just because I'm careful about it in the handout as well. <clears throat> what I want to do is I basically want to conceptually expand the start symbol, okay, to generate a random sentence. And knowing that it's going to select this, I'm going to want to expand this as a, as a, a, a terminal. I'm going to want to expand what's in there. I'm going to want to expand what's in there. This and this are actually simple. It's just supposed to print. This is supposed to recursively do exactly the same thing as if object is the start symbol, okay? And it should actually uh, expand to whatever it's supposed to expand to, okay? Does that make sense? Forget about the libraries. Let me just invent function names. They happen to be the real function names for generating random numbers and things like that, okay? If I assume that grammar is a global variable, just assume it's a global variable. We'll correct that in a little bit. Just because we're dealing with Python doesn't mean we should just be lazy about globals. But just to illustrate um, all three paradigms at once right now, I want to define this function, def expand, and I'm just going to call it symbol. Now you know I do one of two different things depending on um, uh, depending on whether or not the symbol, which I'm just going to assume is being cast in, is either a terminal or a non-terminal, and if it's a non-terminal, then it's definitely in my grammar. Um, if it's the case that a symbol starts with this string, which is incidentally the best way to represent a character, if that's the case, then what I want to do is recognize that I don't want to print the non-terminal. I want to select one of its productions, okay, I'm sorry, one of its definitions from its definition set randomly, and then basically expand in order all of, all of the terms that make up the list, okay? Does that make sense to people? So all I'm going to do is this. Definitions is equal to the global grammar uh, of um, this thing that I'm assuming really in the grammar. And no semicolon. <laughs> okay? That brings in this, or this entire thing. Now there's a built-in, uh, which I'm going to just do this. I'm going to say, uh, I'll just say expansion is equal to, there's a built-in function called choice which takes a, a list. It actually takes either an integer or a list. I'm going to give it a list. Choice is basically the get random function in Python. It's a built-in. If it's given an integer, it gives you an, a number between 0 and that integer um, exclusive, just with random probability, equal distribution. If it gives you a list, it selects any one of the elements from the list with equal probability. That's kind of what I want. I want it to choose this, this, or this with probability one-third. I wanted to choose that with probability one. That's exactly what this line's going to do right here. Okay. Now, on assignment one, when you uh, did it using C++, you did not necessarily use recursion. You probably used the iterator to just visit everything. But if you're thinking uh, in terms of scheme and how it dealt with lists, we didn't use iteration there. We didn't know about mapping, technically, when we did assignment one. but on behalf of something like this, if I understand that expanding this space will just print this space, and expanding space is here period will just print that after I get the else clause up here, okay? Um, and I can also recursively expand that. I can do this, map the expand function 
over what's locally recognized as the expansion so far. Okay, does that make sense? So if this is capable of being levied against start with an angle bracket, it's certainly capable of being levied against that, and I'm just going to implement the else case where it isn't a non-terminal to just do um, uh, sys out right. That's basically the equivalent of printf or c out less than less than without any new lines. It's a raw character printer where I will just print out the symbol. Okay, ultimately every single non-terminal becomes uh, a terminal or a series of terminals to be printed. <coughs> So this is what's going to be doing the printing. Okay, does that make sense? Object orientation, clear imperative style, and I, I am electing to go with um, this functional schemish approach of actually looking at everything that's making up the expansion list as peers and having them all publish themselves, whether there's recursion involved or not. Okay, does that make sense to people? As far as how to do this, uh, <laughs> From the get-go, as a global function, I can actually call the seed function. That just basically is like um, randomized from the CS106 library set. or just shaking up the dice so that we really generate pseudo-random numbers and not, don't start from the same number every single time we run it. And then I might do something like this. Expand. Mm. Now, the handout version is a little bit cleaner about how it actually paginates the answers and things like that. Uh, but that's basically the gist of it, okay? Does that make sense to people? Yes, no? Okay, so what I want to uh, do now is I want to bring the computer up. I'm going to talk about classes and how to define classes in a second, but there's going to be some, I, I want to emphasize some things that confused people um, last autumn when they did this DNA assignment, and it was more or less because I just didn't mention these things specifically last uh, autumn. It's a product of me teaching Python for the first time last autumn when I just didn't know what the problems to expect were going to be. Uh, this is in the handout. There's a clear output. You can actually run this. This is up on um, uh, in the CS107 website. Okay, underneath www, you can go and actually find this if you want to and run it. Okay. Any questions about this before I divorce myself from this example? Yep. So to do recursion um, in this language, then you have to call map. Oh, absolutely not. I just elected to use map. If I wanted to write Fibonacci, I could have definition of Fibonacci call Fibonacci. Okay. If I wanted to, I could have done a four for loop um, from 4i in range of 0 through length of expansion. And I could have just called expand inside a for loop. Yeah, I don't, I don't have to use, I mean, we can always make a direct recursive call in virtually any language that I know of. Okay, I just elected to go with the map approach here because I think it's cleaner and uh, it is kind of the functional way of doing things. Uh, not necessarily that that's the goal, but I'm just illustrating all three paradigms in the same example. Okay, question in the back? What seed is again? Oh, seed right here. Uh, computers, even though there's, when they generate random numbers, they do so deterministically. Okay, so they're not really random, but they're as um, seemingly random as a computer that's completely deterministic in its operation can be. Um, normally what happens every time you launch uh, uh, the Python interpreter, it uses zero or something related to zero uh, to generate the first random number. And then it algorithmically uses prime number theory to generate um, the next sequence in the random number sequence. Um, if you always start from zero, then you get the first same random number every time you run something, and you get the same second number every time you run something. You get the same sequence, and it kind of breaks the, the fallacy. I'm sorry, it exposes the fallacy that these aren't really uh, random numbers. That's actually not a bad thing. A lot of times I, I recommend getting rid of that when you're testing, so you do get the same output every single time, and so you can really debug a lot, a lot easier, a lot more easily. But uh, C just says, you know what, just populate just set it so that the first random number that's going to be generated is related not to zero, but usually, at least in the case of C, and I'm sure it's the case the same in the case of Python, that it usually takes the number of milliseconds or the number of seconds since the computer was turned on um, and relates the first random number to that instead. This is basically the equivalent of srand from C, if you're familiar with that function. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Function choice and my the building function is on Python. Yeah, right here. Where, where, where this seed and this choice, they're both from the same um, module. And technically, if I'm complete about everything up, up top, I should do this. I should do import SYS, it's short for system, obviously. Uh, it's because of that that I'm allowed to go and publish to the console. And I could either import 
um, uh, the random library and then do random.choice and random.seed. Or I can use the sexier way of doing it, which is from random specifically import, um, oops, sorry about that, specifically import uh, choice and seed. And that's another way of doing it. Okay, it's just boilerplate, more boilerplate, learning the language, things like that. Uh, actually, before I go leave this example, I want to do something. I wouldn't write it this way. I'm actually fine with the idea that grammar is a global here, because um, it's just a script. It's just a little script, and it's just the first. It's really executing this as a statement, and then this is a statement, and then this is a statement. I don't really think of grammar as a global. I think of the entire file as a function that it gets executed. Okay, but if you wanted to be a purist about this, and you didn't want this uh, right here to be a global variable, you could. pass in the grammar like that, there's a little bit of a breakdown because now all of a sudden expand is a binary argument function as opposed to a unary argument function. That doesn't mesh too well with the way I've called map, okay? Map and scheme actually can deal with multiple lists depending on the, uh, the arity of the function that's being mapped. That's not the case with Python. Um, this has to be a unary function. It doesn't have to be a named function, okay? If I wanted to frame uh, the implementation, I wanted to frame this function in terms of expand, but as a unary function, I can do that using the scheme idea lambdas. Lambdas actually exist in uh, Python as well. What I can do, it's just syntax, uh, I can invent a function right here. I'm not just writing scheme code here, I'm really writing Python. Uh, Lambda, I'll call it uh, item, for lack of a better word. And you use a colon for the same reasons you use a colon every place else, okay? And I just equate it with expand of uh, item grammar. I'll abbreviate that. That's the first argument. Do you understand how that's a one argument function? Just Believe the syntax. It is right. <laughs> okay. It is scripted as an anonymous one argument function whose implementation is framed in terms of that one argument and this thing that is available as a local variable in the outer scope. And I want to map that over uh, expansion. That's another way to do this. And it really has the functional components of scheme that are interesting to me uh, and probably to a lot of people is it has mapping and it has lambdas and the closures that come with lambdas. Okay, does that make a sense? Okay, good. Okay, so what I want to do uh, is I want to talk about uh, a little bit about uh, the object model from a memory standpoint. I'm going to talk about this to a couple of degrees. I'm just going to worry about dictionaries at, at first. Uh, the, uh, the manner in which dictionaries are passed around is precisely, at least for, the for our purposes, precisely the same as the manner in which objects are passed around in Java. Everything is always passed around by alias or by reference, okay? So if I do this, uh, let me just deal with lists because they're easier to draw and then I'll just generalize to dictionaries. If I do this, like a so, um, it doesn't print anything out, but if I just print X, naturally it does this. If I do this, and then I print out Y, it prints out one, two, three. Okay, that shouldn't surprise you at all. Okay, there are some languages where what I'm about to do would actually be different, but if I go ahead and call X, which is a list, and I do append, and I append a four, if I go ahead and print out X, you know for a fact that it's that, and that isn't the least bit surprising. You've logically updated x. However, what you may not realize is that x was assigned to, um, uh, x was evaluated, and the result of the evaluation was assigned to y. That is just done. All x did was it evaluated to the pointer, to the lead node in a list, or the lead element in an array. So when I go ahead and print this out, I'm going to get that, because I changed y behind uh, behind its back when I actually updated X. 
Does that make sense to people? Yes. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Copy of X for Y. I'll get to that in a second. It doesn't happen by default. You have to invoke uh, one of two functions, depending on whether just a one-level copy or a full deep copy is available to you. Um, this is one thing I did not mention uh, last autumn, um, and it caused problems. My particular solution to assignment eight doesn't use any copying whatsoever. It just shared the same master dictionary um, throughout the entire implementation. But I should not have assumed that everyone would want to do it exactly the same way. So you do need the ability, at least initially, until you convince yourself otherwise, uh, to, to be able to clone dictionaries. I'll talk about that in a second. Let me give you some more sophisticated examples. If I uh, set z equal to the list, uh, let's say 10, 12, 14, and I go out and print z, it's of course going to be this. But then I do this, I'll do w is equal to, and I'll construct a list that way. Okay, z and z evaluates to the list 10, 12, 14. Okay, so when I go ahead and I print out w, not surprisingly, I get this. Okay, I bet everyone believes that. What you don't, might not recognize is that it does not make any deep copies. You do not transfer full ownership of the Z lists uh, into the list that's owned by W. So if I do this, Z dot append 17 and print out Z, it's now this. But more interestingly, if I print out W, I get this. 12, 14, 17, 10, 12, 14, 17. These are obviously contrived examples that are very, very small, but it's illustrating. For some reason, to me at least, it was more mysterious um, because I feel like it was this high level language. It, and it, there, you didn't necessarily know that objects were backing these things. It was very easy to wonder whether or not it took a deep clone or a, a shallow clone, um, but almost always, at least initially, um, it just makes a shallow copy of it, okay? It turns out that the shallow copy is preserved for the lifetime of the, uh, of the, the data uh, in Python. It happens to be different in a language called PHP, which I use a lot at work, um, where when you pass uh, one dictionary around or one list around, it doesn't actually clone it, but it does, re does uh, recognize, it, or it does actually label it as something that was copied from something else. So as you change it, it actually does a copy on write uh, and actually branches off the part that changes so that the two logically look different even though they're sharing memory. Okay, none of that happens in Python though. Okay. If you want to make a uh, copy, there's two ways you can do it. There is a uh, module called copy. Okay, it's I suspect it's written, uh, I, I suspect it's not written in Python. I'm suspecting it's written in C. Um, but I can import something called copy. There's actually another function I'll talk about in a second. Um, if you want to clone an object, uh, bu -bu 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 x is equal to 14, that's 15, 21, and you print out x, you will get uh, 14, 15, 21. If you do this, this is the same as all the prior examples, and you print out Y, you get this, but that shouldn't surprise you. What might, this shouldn't surprise you either. You don't know the syntax, but there's a keyword in the language called is. X is Y is basically equality at the, um, uh, at the pointer level. And so because X and Y really are aliasing the same exact physical memory, not only are they logically identical, but they're memory-wise identical as well, you expect this to come back with a true. Okay, if you want to make a clone of something because you want to make some changes to a data structure without it affecting the original, you can do that. Z is equal to a function called copy. It's this copy right there that does it. And I want to make a copy of X. Not surprisingly, Z is 14, 15, 21, but I'm out of room. But if I did Z is X, I would actually get a false back because they're memory independent at least to some degree. Now copy, you would think that because it's called copy, 
that copy really means deep clone, do this breadth first, uh, depth first traversal and make sure every single piece of memory um, that's generated on behalf of Z is independent from that that was accessible from X. That's not the case. This particular copy is what's known as a shallow copy. It only goes one level down. Okay, so if I had a list of atoms, like I do right here, these really are fully memory independent. But if I were to have lists of lists of lists of lists, does that make sense? The top level list would be uh, replicated from a memory standpoint, but everything inside would just be um, a shallow copy. So it's almost like it generates new memory for the top level array, but then it does a mem copy <laughs> uh, behind the scenes for everything below that. Does that make sense to people when I say that? If you really do want a deep copy, then you have to use this strangely named function called deep copy. Uh, and this is uh, an interesting example. Uh, if I do uh, m is equal to the list 1, 2, 3, I do uh, n is equal to the list m, m, and that's good enough actually. Um, recognize that I have the list 1, 2, 3 in memory. That's my sh abbreviated version of showing the linked list in memory. Uh, and this thing is associated with the variable m. Okay. The uh, linked list that's generated uh, on behalf of n is really this. Does that make sense the way I drew that? Okay. It's the same list appears as in, in index 0 and index 1, but the same uh, list is being pulled in two different scenarios. Okay. If I do this, p is equal to deep copy of n, which is the thing that's interesting to me. Not only does it do a, a recursive descent clone of everything, um, but if there are any cycles like they kind of are in this, forget about M. That doesn't interest me anymore. Do you understand why those two arrows point to the one, the same one? Okay. The deep copy not only figures out how to make a deep logical clone of the entire thing, but it actually uh, figures out how to preserve the graph structure. Okay. Does that make sense to people when I say graph structure? Yes? No? Okay. Uh, so this would be associated with something that was completely independent but would have the same aliasing internally. Okay? That's actually just a wise thing for it to do so that it can rehydrate objects from their serializations if you ever want to go to that part of the Python language. Okay. Make a sense? Now, it is, I'm thinking that you do not need to use these functions for assignment 8. But whatever is said right here on behalf of uh, lists also applies to dictionaries. Okay? You use dictionaries and strings quite a bit in the assignment 8 uh, uh, solution. You don't have to use lists all that much at all. You can if you want to. I use dictionaries to more or less bundle information that would otherwise be aggregated in a struct, like C and C++ would require it. And I use that to kind of aggregate information that's related to one another. Okay, that's, I think, a common practice in a lot of these dynamic modern languages. A Python, certainly Perl to some degree. Uh, I don't know Perl as well, but Python, I certainly know that's the case. I also know it's the case with PHP. Okay. So there's that. What I want to do now is I want to show you a little bit um, about objects and classes in Python. Okay. And show you how they really are very little more than just dictionaries. Okay. This is going to be interesting because I think it's going to be interesting to me. Hopefully it's interesting to you as well. Remember when we learned about the object representation, I'm sorry, the, uh, the activation record layout of a C struct, right? You have a clear order in which fields are declared. You actually declare the fields ahead of time because there's a compile time element to it, so you can bother doing that. And first field goes to the bottom, second field goes above that, third field goes above that, etc. Okay? Objects and structs, classes and structs in C and C++, and actually uh, classes in Java all adopt that model. All classes do is recognize that the structs and classes can be the same thing. They both have uh, data fields. They don't store the me method pointers or anything like that in the struct. They just lay things out ex according to the sa same exact formula. When you see something like that, you just assume that every language that's ever going to be invented from that point on is going to use exactly the same model. However, in a language like Scheme or Python, which have no compile time element whatsoever, you don't pre-declare the types ahead of time. You just add stuff to these dictionaries, which is basically Python's answer to the struct or the class, 
Okay, does that make sense to people? And so you can't specify an order of fields ahead of time because you're not even specifying the fields ahead of time. You just kind of add things to the dictionary as it is suitable for your algorithm. And if you add X and then Y and Z, but in some other execution you add Y and then Z and then X, it should still logically uh, have the same set of keys. They just happen to not be uh, uh, assembled in the, or, I'm sorry, inserted in the same order. Python and most modern uh, languages uh, and to some degree, actually, Objective-C, um, that's the, the Cocoa language for Apple, uh, uses this for storing methods. Um, they actually just put all the fields and store them as strings in a dictionary. Okay? That backs, that's exactly what happens um, backing, uh, for uh, dictionaries and also for classes in Python, which are backed by dictionaries, and we'll get there in a second. Okay, so let me go ahead and let, just show you an example of a class. And I'll do some tinkering at the command line. Okay, this is good enough. And let's just focus on this right here. I don't think I can, uh, that's not good. Da, 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 da. Okay. I'll try to make the font bigger in the meantime. I'm gonna beat him. Might be too big, but we'll correct it in a second. That's not bad, actually. Is it up there? Now it's huge. Actually, that's okay. That's a nice word over there. <laughs> Let's bring it and make it a nice, good word. <laughs> okay, that's good enough, I think. Uh, I'm not worried about the comment that's being clipped off, and I can bring this down. And that's all I'm interested in. Okay, that's great. Actually, it looks like it's like artwork. Um, you see uh, the class keyword. That should just be a, immediately obvious to you that it's going to be defining some class in whatever sense Python defines classes. Uh, you see this underscore, underscore, and init, underscore, underscore thing? That just means it's a special method. Um, not surprisingly, it's related to construction. I'll show you how to construct a lexicon object in a second. Remember how in C++, I, I, always, I probably said it this way about a million times, and now it's a million and one, that it always silently passes the address of the receiving object as the negative one parameter, right? Well, Python doesn't do that. It's very explicit about passing the address of the relevant container or object to all methods, including the constructor. By convention, it's called self. It doesn't have to be. Um, but self is a keyword that's borrowed um, from Objective-C. Um, and uh, I think that's right. Yeah, actually, it is. Um, Objective-C, uh, self, it's just basically Python's equivalent of this right here. Okay. Because objects are, are initialized dynamically, there's no compile time element whatsoever. It takes this empty object. There really is a default, a default object called object. That's part of the language. It's like java.lang.object. Uh, but you just add stuff to it. And what's happening here is that I'm have create two local variables. Um, uh, one's called uh, in file, one's called words. From that point on, it initializes fields. But these two lines right here, forget about them being inside a, a constructor. They're just methods. fopen happens to be uh, the, the function that opens a, a file. Um, read lines is this built-in thing that actually takes an entire text file and builds an array where every single, uh, every single entry is populated with one line from the original file. I'm not going to show you the file. You can just imagine that the words file that's open by default is an alphabetically ordered list of all the English words in the language with no intervening white space except for the backslash ends for new lines. Okay. So I synthesized this right here. Uh, the read lines, it actually preserves the backslash n, which is really annoying, but it just does it. Um, so what I do here is I introduce the first ever field to the lexicon object by saying, you know what, you didn't have anything before, but now you have this words field. If it had it before, it would just reinitialize it and rebind it to something. But since I'm taking a raw object, uh, I'm actually inserting one more thing into the dictionary that's backing the object, and it's initially set equal to the empty array. Okay, and then I just do brute force um, for looping. This is what's called an iterable. It's actually an array. That's why I synthesized this, this right here. Okay, and it just goes through and it takes whatever words in that words array, truncates off the backslash n, and puts it in the words array that's embedded inside the lexicon. Okay, does that make sense to people? 
Okay, now to, to whatever degree it's successful for you, just subscribe to your C++ and uh, Java sensibilities as far as what constructors are for and what they're intended to do. A lot of this is just different syntax. It has some quirks. It's dynamic, so it doesn't have a class definition. There's no .h file. There's no implied interface by a .java file. It really is just this like kind of deal with it as it runs type of functionality. But nonetheless, this entire thing is responsible for taking a raw object, uh, a raw object, and building it up to be a logically sound lexicon. If I just show you the next, oops, didn't mean to do that, but I'll bring it back in a second. The next method, it really is a method. It's a, it's a function definition that just happens to be, I'm not sure I can get the entire thing in there. The def is over there in the left, but you can just look at this. Uh, Self.words, there's this bi bisect function. It's just like bsearch. It's a little bit different. It's more like the lower bound function from C++ in that it just returns uh, either the index of the matching element or the index where the thing could be inserted okay, in order for it to be inserted, in order for it to maintain alphabetical ordering. I initialized the words array so that it was alphabetically ordered. All I'm doing here is I'm asking whether or not the word that's explicitly supplied when I invoke this contains word function, um, whether or not when I do a binary search for it and get the insertion index for it, whether or not that actual slot in the words array matches the word I passed in. So I'm actually going to slide this over, see what the double equals is, whether or not it's equal to the word local variable. Okay, you get the gist of what's, what I'm attempting there? Okay, I have some other methods. I'll just name them. They're not that algorithmically interesting. Word contains everything. I'll show you how that works in a second. List all words containing. I'll show you those in a second. What I want to do, is I want to bring my terminal back and show you how this works. Let me make sure I'm in the right directory. I am. Let me do a less to make sure I have words. I do. Let me invoke Python. This is how you deal with objects in Python. It's a little quirky, but there's, there's a good narrative that can, that can be, um, be made as to why things work the way they do. If I want to use this lexicon class, well, just like all the functions inside divisors.py and all the functions inside the copy module and the random module and things like that, um, I have to import, I'm sorry, from lex, because this is all stored in lex.py, I want to import the class or the symbol, whatever functionality is associated with the symbol lexicon. Okay, and I do that and it works. Uh, I can do this. I'll do, uh, I don't want to use L. I'll, yes, I will. I'll spell it out. Uh, is equal to lexicon, just like that. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, you can just you can tell me. <laughs> I didn't do that. <laughs> okay. Do this. It might give me a complaint. Can you see it now? Barely, but yes. Okay. Now you can't hear me. Uh, this right here initializes, there's no new, new keyword in uh, Python. The name of the class in this case is what's called a callable. And if you invoke it as a function, it's a request to, um, uh, to build an instance of that class. When I do this, it actually builds EL. I can do a couple things here. Lexicon, if you just type that in, it just tells, it reminds you that it is in fact a class. Here's one thing, just to show you how um, relevant dictionaries are to the lexicon class. There's a special meta variable that's inside all objects, okay, inside a lot of things, but in particular objects at the moment. You ask for its dictionary. It, doesn't, it's a, it looks like gibberish, but you see gestures to um, a lot of things. You see some weirdly named keys like underscore underscore module and underscore underscore init, okay? Does that make sense? But you can clearly see that they're keys in some dictionary the way it's scripted out. So the in-memory model of an actual class definition, okay, is a list of all the symbols that are embedded inside. The ones that we cr created are underscore, underscore, init, and um, contains word, and list all words containing, and contains all characters, or whatever I called it, or word contains everything, okay? Does that make sense? So the actual class object is modeled by a dictionary. That doesn't happen in C or C++ at all. Everything's done at compile time, and it just generates all of these ones and zeros that are consistent with the original definition of the class. In Java, there really is something like this. It's actually not a dictionary, it's a standalone class. 
that gets stored in memory, but it, it's not that different from this right here, but there really is a, uh, an in-memory representation of the class idea itself. Uh, I can't show you EL, that would be a lot. Um, uh, well, actually, I will show you EL. If I do this, it tells you it's an instance of the lexicon in the LEX module. Everything, it's twice I've done that. Mm. Uh, when I do this, it's going to show you the, the dictionary that's not associated with the lexicon class, but the dictionary that's associated with the instance of that, that class that I just created. Now, this is going to whiz by. It's going to take a couple seconds. Actually, that wasn't that bad. Uh, I can't scroll up because we're, we're dealing with 150,000 words. Okay. Well, actually, I could, but I'm not going to. Um, what I will do is I will break the... Uh, Whoops, didn't like that, sorry. Okay, that's a little weird that I did that. Remember that words was a field that I introduced inside? There's no notion of privacy whatsoever in Java. You're only supposed to deal with that by policy and understand that there probably are fields inside you're not supposed to touch. Um, there is some way to actually mark something as intentionally private using underscores. I'm not saying it's not used, it's just, it's kind of a hack. There really is no enforced encapsulation in Python. It just relies on the programmer to be a good programmer uh, and to not touch um, inner fields or functionality that it doesn't think it needs to touch. But now if I do this, you won't get the original dictionary, but you'll get that right there. Okay? Before, words had this array that all went all the way through through Ziziva. Okay? And I just happened to empty it out. Okay? But what I'm illustrating here is that the object itself is backed by a dictionary, and all the attributes, in this case there was only the words attribute, Okay, but all those attributes actually are keys that are associated with some inner dictionary that's identified via underscore underscore D-I-C-T underscore underscore. Okay, does that make sense? So you see how central the dictionary is to the Python language. Okay, I'm guessing you do. Okay, so there's that. What else do I want to do? Let's actually just, because uh, it's fun, not because it's really important, let's rebuild the lexicon. Uh, contains word hello just to show that it actually works it does okay and then I want to list all the words I love doing this all the words that have all the vowels da, 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 da. Oh, I didn't do that that's not what I meant <laughs> list all words containing spell it right yes okay not neat <laughs> Okay, I mean, it's very brute force. This, this, isn't, this isn't the magic of Python. That's just the way I implemented it. It's just a regular class. Um, but the implementation of this is on the last page of the handout I gave out last time, the Python Basics handout. And it's just a matter of gleaning syntax. Uh, I can tell you right now from experience that when you go out and get a programming job, it, it very well may be in C++ or Java. It may be in some language you have very little experience with. But you can't be, oh, I don't know how to do it. Like binary search is mysterious in all of the languages. It really isn't. It's just a matter of learning the actual syntax and the, and the idioms that the language supports for getting things like iteration and recursion and classes and structs and objects and all that kind of stuff down. Um, let's see if there's this. Just that one. Okay. Um, and then obviously there's nothing else. Let's see if there's any words that begin with have A, B, C, D, E, and F in them. Well, that's not bad. Okay. N G. Nope. Okay. Okay. So that, that's just that's just playground stuff. That's kindergarten stuff. Just doing that. Um, what I want to do now is I want to show you. A, let me just draw. I'm trying to think if I want to do some stuff. I do actually. Let me um, put this to bed. What I want to do is, uh, make a few remarks about the illusion of objects being just dictionaries. When you do something like this, um, let's say, uh, at the prompt you do O is equal to object. This is the equivalent of java.lang.object. You do that right there. You get, um, Absolutely nothing uh, in response to this. You just get O as an instance of the object. But if you do this, 
you actually get that right there. Does that make sense to people? Okay. I'm asking it to identify the collection of attributes that have been accumulated inside the object I'm calling O, or the instance of the object I'm calling O. Uh, when I do this, and then I do this, uh, and I do this, They're really instructions to insert a new value in the dictionary that is underscore, underscore, D-I-C-T, underscore, underscore. So if I do this, I actually get three fields. I'll assume they hash in this order. Okay. When you do this, you're not respecting encapsulation. You're supposed to let methods do this, but I'm telling, I told you already that it doesn't respect any kind of privacy. There really is no support for privacy that's, that's genuine and real. Um, there's that, but doing these three lines right here is just like doing this. And in fact, it more or less translates to this. dot underscore underscore dict underscore underscore c is equal to false. This right here is basically syntactic sugar. It doesn't look like syntactic sugar, but it is in the case of Python, because this is just taken to be an instruction to not really try to do this, but to do that right there. It's really physically levying an operation against the dictionary that's inside of it. Okay. So the takeaway point from this, I'll talk a little bit more about this in the first five or ten minutes of Monday, um, but the takeaway point here is that the objects are backed by these growable, shrinkable containers. Um, they have to be growable and shrinkable in ways that they don't have to be for C, C++, and Java, because C, C++, and Java do all this wedding planning up front, where everything has to be set in stone before any code executes whatsoever. Python is a fully dynamic language. It's supposed to be able to, everything's supposed to be able to grow and shrink. Everything about it's supposed to be dynamic. So you're not supposed to impose limits on how big something can be, unless it's an implementation limit, like you just can't store more than like two to the 12th keys in a dictionary or something like that. Okay, so activation record as an idea, it works beautifully for C and C++ where it can actually do all the scrubbing up front, but for Python, it can't. It has to back all of the objects uh, with a different model, and this is exactly how it does it. Okay, so you definitely have enough information to crank through assignment eight. Um, come Monday, I want to talk a very little about um, inheritance. I know you know a little bit of inheritance from either AP Java or from uh, 106A. Okay, you may, if you take a 108, then, you'll, then you, the, everything will be easy. But I will just talk a little bit about inheritance and how it's relevant uh, to some of, the, I think, the more interesting ways of um, doing networking operations, which is what this handout I gave out today is all about. Okay, so you guys have a good weekend. I'll see you Monday.